two. Okay, we are live. So again, watch that. Um, hi folks for joining us early and um, we'll be with you very shortly and we'll introduce our guest tonight um, So it should be a good one uh, There we go uh, So I'm gonna get this out to social media folks, uh, but again get your questions coming in But uh, yeah tonight we're with or wherever you're is it morning uh, afternoon wherever you're from but with uh, Kim Campbell but uh, yeah how have you been doing since our last chat uh, you've been busy because you've had a book release haven't you yes it has been busy but uh, but things are good it's uh, the book has been really exciting it's done really well um, and has hit bestseller status in the first week of its wow. release so it is exciting uh, it's nice to know and not to mention Top Gun coming out that makes it an exciting time for everyone yeah, congratulations on that. Uh, yeah, just give us a bit of background on the book. What's it about and uh, where can our viewers find it? Sure. Um, so the book is titled Aiming Higher, and it's it's our journey through military aviation leadership. And it's five authors. All of us are pilots. We're all United States Air Force Academy graduates, but we have different backgrounds. Uh, we have a Thunderbird pilot, obviously an A-10 pilot, special operations pilot, um, and so various backgrounds, um, but we each have some common beliefs about how um, our time flying airplanes impacted us as leaders and how those lessons really impacted us um, throughout our career in the military and even beyond. Uh, so it's, it's some short stories. I think it's a pretty easy read. Um, for me, I share stories about flying and red flag. I share some stories about uh, getting some upgrades in the A-10, some of those that didn't go as well uh, as others. Uh, but it's all the things that kind of made me the leader um, that I am and the, the parent, uh, the, the speaker now. It, it impacted all of these things. So it, I think it's a great read. I really enjoyed reading the other authors' stories as well, and you can find it on Amazon. Yeah, and that's all linked in the description for you guys. But uh, yeah, maybe you can just give us a couple of minutes on your background before I saw the guys in the comments can get their questions coming in, Kim. Yeah, you bet. Um, I spent 24 years in the United States Air Force. Most of that time was spent flying A-10s. I spent time overseas, uh, deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan for Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. I also spent time uh, as a uh, leading uh, in the Air Force, leading squadrons and groups, uh, and so got that incredible leadership opportunity. I also spent some time at the 422 Test and Evaluation Squadron, transitioning the A-10A from the a 10 or to the A-10C, uh, and so really, um, it was a great ride. Um, it was nice for it to culminate and come to an end. I spent the, the end of my career at the Air Force Academy, which is where it started for me, um, which was a great opportunity to give back and help influence the next generation. I spent time there as an instructor and also as the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development. So overall, a great 24 years. My absolute favorite part was flying the A-10 and supporting our troops on the ground. Um, but uh, now I have the opportunity to share some of those stories and share some of those lessons learned. Yeah, well, I mean, what an amazing career and a privilege to have you on uh, tonight, Kim. So as you can see in the side, there's some uh, questions coming in. So Kim, I'm going to let you loose and guys, get your questions coming in for Kim and enjoy. All right. So we'll take a we'll take a look at just kind of starting from the top here on some of these questions. So um, the first question that came in from military aviation and air defense, um, what do you think about the survivability of the A-10 against an advanced army air defense? So the A-10 was really designed for more of the low to medium threat environment, and we've been operating in that environment fairly successfully. Um, but a high threat situation is very different for the A-10. If we're going to go into a high threat situation, and we have, I mean, the, the situation in Iraq in the early days did have some high threat surface to air missiles, then we go in with a, a package of aircraft. So we'll want SEED, the suppression of enemy air defense aircraft. Uh, we Ideally, those aircraft will take out the threats before we get there. Um, so I think, you know, can we operate in higher threat environments? Yes. Were we designed to do that? No. Um, and if we're going to, then, it, then, then we need teammates. We need um, other aircraft that are designed for that that can help take out the threats. Um, we're obviously a very survivable aircraft. Uh, I have personal experience with that. Um, but 
at the same time, um, it's a it's an acceptance level of risk. And so in that high threat near peer environment, um, you know, the A10 may not be as effective as, as it has been uh, in previous conflicts. All right, we'll roll on to some other questions here. Um, what was it like faring the A-10? How many hops would it take to get across the Atlantic or North Pacific? Um, so I can tell you that flying the A-10 across the Atlantic is uh, quite the experience. I, When I deployed to Iraq, um, we actually deployed to Kuwait first and then on to Iraq. Um, but we flew our A-10s from Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina. We would take off early morning and uh, we had to wear... Um, our normal flight gear, but on top of that, we had to wear something called a poopy suit, which is like this really uncomfortable rubber suit uh, with one giant zipper that we called the jaws of death. And uh, that was our gear that we had to fly across the Atlantic in. So it wasn't comfortable. And we would spend eight to nine hours in the aircraft refueling multiple times. And it could be Honestly, it could be downright boring where it's just the weather's beautiful and, you know, it's exciting for a while and then it just gets kind of monotonous and that's where we play Trivial Pursuit, we do anything to stay awake. Uh, and then it can be downright terrifying um, when we're trying to refuel. If the weather is bad, you're not sure you're going to be able to get gas. And that's what really makes it tough is, you know, then you're constantly on, your adrenaline is going, there's always, you always have to know where your divert fields are so that if you can't get gas from the tanker, then you have an opportunity to divert because honestly, the other option is eject ejecting into the ocean, which uh, I don't think anybody wants to do. Um, so uh, it was always an experience. There was always some, there's always stories that, that come from those events uh, crossing the pond as we call it. Um, but it was a, uh, it was always kind of a, a rite of passage as well. You wanted to make sure you did it once. Uh, and then once we got to our location, we usually stopped at the Azores um, as our first stop. Uh, then it was kind of cut loose and relaxed for a few days and uh, and then start the journey again. But it was uh, it's always an exciting time, those pond crossings, and there's always great stories that come from them. All right, we'll move on to our next question here. Uh, okay, I've been getting this one a lot lately uh, from Timberwolf. I, I see the question about UFOs, and I've seen a lot in the news. There has been a lot in the news lately. And I guess my only answer to this is the A-10s fly too low to see anything like this. Um, I, I have never experienced anything like that, haven't seen anything out of the ordinary. Um, and so uh, I guess a short answer to this question is no, I haven't had any experience with this. And I can only assume it's because we fly lower than everybody else. All right, um, from David Smith, what do you enjoy more, firing the gun or flying low and fast, or as fast as the hog will go, of course? Um, both. <laughs> my, my final flight in the A-10 was a low altitude flight. Uh, I led a four ship of A-10s, and we took off uh, from Davis Monthan Air Force Base, went out to the ranges, and our goal was to not break like 1,500 feet. That was kind of our near pattern altitude, but we took off, stayed low, uh, dropped down to 100 feet once we got on the range, stayed low maneuvering out on the range, and then popped up only of just above the terrain to shoot the gun, uh, and then evaded back out um, through the terrain again. So, uh, I can't, I don't think I can choose. It's, it's both um, because I love flying low altitude in the A-10. Um, if you've seen Top Gun, there's some scenes about aircraft flying through terrain and it is, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And even though the A-10 isn't what we would consider fast compared to the other fighters, uh, when you're at 100 feet above the ground, uh, the A-10 is very fast from that perspective. The, uh, you can see out on the Arizona desert, you can see the cactus uh, next to you. Uh, and we're moving pretty quickly. So I love both of them. If you want to make me choose, and if I have to choose, then I will say shooting the gun, because there's nothing quite like that in the A-10. All right, let's see what other questions are out there. Uh, let's see, <laughs> from Avgeek Joe. Hello, Joe. Uh, I have met Joe before. Uh, he has attended one of my events, but uh, his question is about how's the second book? Um, and uh, so we talked about aiming higher, but uh, I've got a second book coming out. I'm really excited about it. It's been a long uh, work and journey. 
And this one is my story. This one is about my experience um, joining the Air Force, uh, flying in combat, the lessons that I learned along the way. And it's scheduled to be released in March of uh, 2023. So thanks for asking, Joe. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see, more questions. Uh, from Low Blow, thanks for coming on the show. Any danger close stories? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so danger close, um, for those that aren't familiar, is when we are dropping weapons so close to friendly forces that you have to get the ground commander's initials because it's with inside um, a distance that puts a that it is threatening to our friendly forces. And that's always a tough one because I think for me, even even if you get the ground commander's initials, like I'm still hitting the pickle button or I'm still pulling the trigger. So if something were to happen, um, it's still on me. Um, and, uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's one of those things for an A-10 pilot, um, we train to do, uh, we train to do it, uh, well, and most of the time in those situations, we're going to use the gun because the gun is our absolutely most accurate weapon. Um, but it, that is a, that's always a tough scenario when you hear danger close on the radio, because you know that, um, friendly lives are on the line and it's in your hands, um, but so those are those are some tough ones. So thanks for asking. I personally um, have not had a, a danger close scenario. Um, there are a lot of stories out there about A-10 pilots that have shot very close to friendlies and um, they've done very well because it's what we train to do. But that's that's always a tough one. Uh, let's see. I got to be able to read fast here. Um did you ever practice landing on roads or rough airfields? Um, there's a great, great footage of the 442nd doing that in Michigan. Uh, no, that was after my time. So um, I left the 422 right at the time we were starting to land on dry lake beds. Um, but it's pretty awesome to be able to see the A-10 land on dry lake beds in rough terrain and on highways. Um, because if there's not an airfield, we want to be able to land um, as close as we can to get us closer to the friendly location. Um, I would say the only rough airfield that I landed on uh, was Bagram Air Base uh, in Afghanistan, which, you know, after 10 years of time, it's a it's a beautiful runway um, there. But in 2002, when I was first in Afghanistan, um, I remember my very first combat mission into Bagram in Afghanistan. And as we came over the top of the airfield, so we would fly right over the top of the air base and then when we did what we called the whirlpool, so we would kind of spiral down right over the airfield um, to avoid the threats in the area. Uh, we got to the point where we, we would actually like roll inverted and, and do a split S down to land, um, but we would stay right over the airfield. And I remember on my first approach, as I kind of come around the corner to put it on the runway, the controller says, make sure you stay on the right side of the runway only which is a little bit non-standard because you're usually not trying to limit yourself on the runway. But I did, I obviously was going to comply with the direction. So I stayed on the right side of the runway and I remember rolling out on the runway and it was this realization of why the controller told me that is because I looked over at the left side and there were potholes and these rocks like the size of softballs. Um, and so that was the, the worst runway that I ever landed on, but, uh, not sp the, the short answer is not specifically to what you're talking about, but pretty awesome capability of the A-10. All right, more questions coming in and I apologize if I, I miss your question. I'm trying to track and read and talk at the same time here. I know as an A-10 pilot, I should be able to do that. So, uh, you can critique me later. Uh, let's see, what would be the best move for an A-10 being attacked by an F-16, MiG-29, or Su-27? Fly low and evade or turn a hard 180 and shoot them in the face. So uh, it depends. It's always the answer to every fighter pilot question. They're both good tactics. It kind of depends on the situation. Um, you know, the problem with the A-10 is we don't have radar. So a lot of times these aircraft can see us before we have any idea that they're there. It's not always the case. We practice this in red flag, but generally at red flag, when we ingress to the target area, we're trying to hide um, from the enemy red air. So some of these aircraft 
simulated, right, are the aircraft that we're trying to hide against. And so we'll fly very low, 100 feet, trying to hide behind the terrain. But there does, you know, there's potentially the point where, you know, you didn't get shot down yet. Um, you know, they're trying to find you through the, the ground clutter. And we call it circle the hog. So, you know, the, the nice thing about the A-10 is we're, you know, we don't have the radar, but we're very maneuverable. And so if we get an F-6 16 mixed up with us so they can't shoot us down with the radar because we're in the ground clutter you know then they're going to try to uh, to take us out and uh, we do something we call circle the hogs and the idea is that we get our nose on them before they get their nose on us and that's really our chance and so when we circle multiple a10s together now someone's nose is always out there where they can put the nose on the on another aircraft um so um, we generally don't like to, you know, fight those other type of aircraft. It wouldn't be our choice. Again, we're looking for the uh, air to air, um, our air to air brothers and sisters to take them out first. But if we get in that situation, which I can tell you, I've been in that situation at Red Flag, and uh, we, me and my wingman, had the opportunity to uh, to take out an F-16. It's pretty exciting um, in a Red Flag mission debrief for an A-10 pilot to say stop, and then uh, call the kill. Um, better make sure it's actually a kill, but it's pretty exciting when that happens because they're generally not expecting the A-10 pilots to be able to do that. So uh, so the short answer, again, is both tactics work. Uh, let's see. What improvements from Michael Millington, what improvements would you have made to the A-10 if given an opportunity? Uh, we, better engines. I mean, it really what it comes down to, um, the engines on the A-10, they're very reliable. Um, the the they are very reliable. But that being said, there's not quite enough thrust coming out of those engines to really be as effective as we could be in an environment that's higher elevation and carrying all of our ordnance. So I'll give you some examples. Nellis in the summer, we would go out um, when I was at the 422 Test and Evaluation Squadron. One of our jobs was to um, test every weapon that the A-10 could drop. Um, I know it's rough. Um, it, that was a great time to be there. But loading all those weapons up was tough uh, because it, we were very heavy. We didn't always do it all at the same time, but we were very heavy. And in the summertime, we would often have to take off with a lighter load of gas to be able to carry the weapons that we needed to test. The other option is you don't carry all the weapons that you need, which this is also a problem in Bagram in Afghanistan, where you're going to take off with less weight or sorry, less fuel weight, so you can have more uh, weapon weight, and then you take off and you can go air refuel. Um, but that kind of thing makes it tough. And so I think um, better engines are something that almost every A-10 pilot will tell you that they would like. They've been very reliable, they've been very good to us, but we could certainly use some new engines, um, assuming the A-10 stays around, which is a, a question in itself. Um, but great question. Um, let's see. So from Rabbit Squadron, how quickly were you able to switch ordnance and cope with the aircraft in terms of complexity? Is it simple to switch it up quickly and respond to the situation? Yes, because we trained to it. Um, so we really were trained on all the weapons on the A-10. Um, for the most time, for the for the most part, um, we would do a combat reload um, where the ma our maintenance troops are doing it pretty quickly, but we're generally putting up the same type of weapons. Um, but because we carry so many different types of weapons and at the same time we're carrying rockets, we're carrying Mavericks, we're carrying whether they're, they're bombs of some sort, whether la uh, laser guided or GPS guided, we train to it all. So it's really not a big deal. I think the one situation that gets a little bit tricky is, for example, when we first deployed uh, to Kuwait, we were supporting Operation Southern Watch. And then Operation Anaconda happened in Afghanistan, where our ground troops really needed um, close air support. And so we started moving A-10s to Afghanistan. And so the tricky part then becomes balancing fighting in two different theaters, you know, two different areas of operation. The weapons are different, not as big a deal. The rules of engagement are different. And so you have to be able to transition. So we're carrying different maps, different weapons, different rules of engagement, and transitioning between one um, kind of overwatch, you know, Southern Watch, we were predominantly doing combat search and rescue mission. And then we'd fly into Afghanistan, and now we're doing close air support. Uh, it really made it 
complicated um, and really required us to be fully engaged in what mission we were doing uh, at what time. Um, but our maintenance troops are amazing and they can reload these airplanes. Um, it's really incredible to see what they can do, especially in combat. These There's something about the A-10. It performs better from an operations and maintenance stand, standpoint when we're deployed, when we're in combat. It's like it knows uh, and uh, we can just produce airplanes and get them out the door. And our maintenance troops are really amazing at, at doing those quick turns. All right, let's keep going here. Let's see. Uh, I think I've answered a few of these. <laughs> okay. Could, should the A-10 be put back into production with 21st century sensors and more powerful engines if you had your way in the course of funding? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think the A-10, I mean, could it be put back into production? That, that may be a little bit trickier. Um, could we pull aircraft out of the boneyard um, at, in Tucson and um, get them back up to speed? Yeah, I think we could. Should they? Um, you know, I guess I'm a big proponent of the A-10, and I think it has a lot of value. I think our ground troops will tell you it has a lot of value. Um, it's not very expensive compared to other airplanes. So um, I just looked at the Air Force fact sheet, and it says the A-10 is $9.8 million. I mean, when you compare that to some of the other fighters out there, it's like pennies. Um, so I don't think it hurts, right? I, I know there, there's money is always the issue, um, but I think, you know, fairly low cost um, in the scheme of things, and it allows us to fight in that low to medium threat environment and something that we do very well. But I also understand the other side, if we're going to prepare for the future, the future fight, the future threats, uh, the money's got to come from somewhere. So in Kim Campbell's personal opinion, in my world, I'd say keep the A-10s flying for as long as we can. They need new wings. Uh, we have we have bent the airplanes over flying for many years um, without some of the technology that we had. You know, for example, um, we now have an electronic means of telling us if we over-G the aircraft. We didn't used to have that, not quite to the capability that we do now. And so I think for many years, we've been over-G in the airplane. So it needs some work. I mean, we need replacement parts and money would have to go into it. But I mean, um, maybe that's just my personal world of I'd love to see the A-10 flying for as long as I can. We have cadets at the Air Force Academy that really want to fly the A-10. And I would certainly love to see it stick around. Uh, let's see, a few more here. Uh, Stuart Simpson Smith, good question. Um, what do I miss most about the A-10 and the Air Force in general in comparison to civilian life? Um, I miss... I miss, I miss the A-10, right, in terms of flying. I miss the airplane. I miss that camaraderie that's in a fighter squadron. Um, I miss being able to go out and fly low levels and shoot the gun. Um, I don't miss a lot of the bureaucracy and the meetings and all of those things that go with it. Um, but I think, you know, it goes to just even outside, you know, I haven't flown the A-10 um, for a while now since I spent my last three years at the Air Force Academy. And so I, I've, you know, I've kind of come to the, you know, I come, I, I came to grips with not flying the A-10 anymore. I mean, it was my why for so many years, you know, my personal passion was supporting our troops on the ground. And then when I got to the Air Force Academy, I got to fly in the T-53, which is a Cirrus SR-20. And that was how we taught other, um, other pilots, the cadets, how to fly. Not quite like flying the A-10. Um, but I, I kind of came to this new pur purpose and passion of, of, you know, no longer being able to support our ground troops from flying A-10s, but now helping to inspire and lead the next generation. Um, and now that that is gone in terms of being active duty in the military, um, I'm finding new ways uh, to do that. I mean, I, I do miss the camaraderie most. I think that is it, is the people. Um, but now I'm finding new ways to do that, whether it's speaking or working on books and trying to share those stories and lessons. Um, but yeah, I miss the camaraderie and watching Top Gun uh, made me realize that was that it's that camaraderie and the fun and, you know, um, fun times that we have together while also giving each other a hard time and pushing each other to be uh, our absolute best. So that's the those are the good things for sure. All right, a few more. We'll keep going here. 
what station airbase had the best food and bars. Uh, you know, the funny thing is the A-10, and that's from Chris Bloxham, uh, the A-10 has never really like been stationed, at least in my time flying the A-10 in the, in the, you know, the best, um, necessarily the best locations. Um, if, and if we talk about any station, um, that I've been to, not just A-10 bases, um, I spent two years, uh, in the UK, I spent, um, uh, going to school, uh, and I spent a year in London, um, going to school at Imperial College. So, uh, that's my that's my easy answer was spending time in London uh, obviously was such a great experience and a lot of fun um, not so much bars but pubs um, but that was a great opportunity uh, to be there many of the other places I've been have not been as good um, but I think any place is really what you make of it and I think that's one thing I've learned and that's one thing I tell kind of our young cadets that are coming through at the Air Force Academy you know you get assignments and it's maybe not your top choice but Everything is what you make of it. And uh, I would say my favorite assignment in the A-10 was at Pope Air Force Base in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which um, it's not really the hot spot or place you would go on vacation. But to me, what made it was um, we were there for, um, let's see, about four years. Um, I spent multiple times deploying while I was there between Iraq and Afghanistan but I think what made it was the people. And so when we weren't deployed, we were out having a great time and and um, building that camaraderie. And so it was really the people that made it. Um, and we made our own parties and our own, our own fun times to make up for the rest of it. All right, let's see, what else do we have here? From, I'm trying to pick some people that I haven't answered questions to. Um, from Josh Bayless. Um, did you ever get to meet any of the troops you supported after the deployment? Um, yes. Um, and I think that was probably, to me, that's been one of the most re rewarding things about being an A-10 pilot is we have such a close relationship with the troops on the ground, even if we don't meet them. Um, but being at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan was a really incredible opportunity to meet troops that we supported because we were a lot of us living at Bagram or at least, um, you know, the troops that were further out might come through Bagram on the way back. Um, and so we got the opportunity to meet some of them. Um, and some of them I didn't meet, but they left notes for me. And I will tell you that probably for me more than anything describes why I do what I do. You know, why I've absolutely loved flying the A-10 is interacting with the ground troops. And getting a note that says you saved our ass over Baghdad. Thank you. Like that's it. Right. That's all I need. Um, social media has been pretty cool. It, you know, it wasn't really around in 2003 and, you know, in the early days of my deployments. Um, but I've had several people reach out and share stories of, um, times where we've supported them. I had an incredible, um, young woman reach out to me that told me that I, um, helped save her dad's, um, unit and uh, and that she wouldn't be around if it wasn't for A-10s overhead. So it's things like that, I think, that really make it powerful in terms of, you know, why we do it, you know, why it matters to us is, you know, to get somebody home safely um, to live another day. Um, but those those opportunities are, are fantastic. And um, I, I love the opportunity to connect with ground troops um, just to share the story and learn about, you know, what we did well and what we should do better the next time. So thanks for asking that. Uh, let's see. From Eagleman77, did you enjoy gun runs or hitting things with GBUs? Uh, both. <laughs> um, shooting the A-10, um, shooting the gun on the A-10 is a, I will tell you, it's like this full body experience, right? So we roll in and the first time you shoot the gun, somebody is in trail right behind you, just making sure that you're doing things correctly. You do a couple dry passes, meaning you're going to roll in on the target. It's all very well orchestrated. There's a ground uh, controller, a range control officer, and they're watching you very closely. Um, and then you get the opportunity to go hot. And the first time pulling that trigger is just, you know, it's a full body experience. You, you pull the trigger, the gun shakes, you can see the gun gases, you can smell it. Uh, you can see the bullets impact the target. So it's pretty awesome. Um, but the first time uh, dropping bombs is pretty amazing too. I think, you know, they release from the airplane and it's kind of like a clunk. It's not very exciting. It's not quite like the gun. 
but uh, seeing something hit a target and um, especially the live bombs, the, the dumb bombs, some of the training bombs are not very excited, but the live bombs dropping those is really impressive um, because obviously there's a large explosion uh, at the end of it. So uh, the short answer is both. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. From David Smith, uh, do you often train with Army Aviation? I know that 80s Doctrine preached Apaches and A-10s together in the Folda Gap. Are there other U.S. NATO aviation communities that are particularly good at CAS? Um, so we did, um, we trained with Army Aviation. Um, we trained with Air Force uh, AC-130s. Um, so Army Aviation um, was one of those things that we try to do. It was a... Uh, an upgrade, if you will, kind of a certification. Um, we called it JAT, uh, Joint Attack, Joint Air Attack, I think. Um, but we we did th we did some missions with them, um, mostly Apaches, just to really combine firepower. The Apache is obviously very impressive and can get in there with guns, and then we can bring some potentially larger firepower to the fight. Um, with an AC-130, we did something what we would call as we'd uh, be up in a perch. So the AC-130 does their their turns, and we would kind of sit up in this perch position. And when they would stop with their guns, we could roll in um, and shoot our 30 millimeter. Um, talk about a lot of firepower. Um, it was pretty impressive. Um, got the opportunity to do that to support our special operators, um, but really an impressive amounts of firepower. Um, in terms of aviation communities that are good at CAS, close air support, I think everybody's had to get good at it over the past 20 years. I mean, I think airplanes that where it wasn't their primary mission, you know, the F-16, the Strike Eagle, CAS wasn't their primary mission. It was something that they trained to do, but it wasn't their primary. For us, it, you know, it's our bread and butter. That's what we do. But I will tell you that over the years, that community stepped up. Um, they had to, um, to support our troops on the ground. And so I think, you know, um, those aircraft are particularly good at CAS. Um, same thing with NATO. NATO, I think I'll, we all stepped up. You know, it, we all found that even if it wasn't something that we had always trained to do, we found ways to do it. And, um, you know, aircraft that weren't intended to shoot at the ground, you know, where their guns were really designed for an air threat, um, stepped up and figured out ways to do it um, because of where the conflict has been in the past 20 years. All right, let's see. <laughs> All right, air crew interview. All right, Mike, how many times have you seen the movie already? I'm assuming you're referring to Top Gun, and uh, I've only seen it once. Um, I have to tell you, if you haven't seen the movie yet, watch the first one again, and then come back and watch the second one. Because for me, um, there were some things that I forgot and I had, I knew they were from the first one, but it would have been fun to kind of see the connection. There's so many sayings and things that, that are pulled from the first movie. But um, if you really want to drill down and talk about the aviation and the actual flying in Top Gun, it's probably going to irritate you when you watch it. If you just want to be, um, you know, entertained, it's a great movie. Um, but there's a lot of um, we'll say things that maybe aren't as accurate in the flying community that happen in that movie, but that's okay. It's an incredibly um, entertaining movie. Uh, so uh, I, I highly recommend to go see it. All right, a few more here. Let's see. Um, trying to find a few from people that haven't um, asked questions. So from Stephen Hampton, did you ever BFM before? Uh, BFM, basic fighter maneuvers, dog fighting. So interestingly enough, the A-10, we actually have to get qualified in BFM. We actually have to maintain that currency. Um, and before we even shoot the gun on the airplane, we go out and fly BFM. The whole idea be with flying BFM is you figure out how the airplane flies. You understand more of what the envelope is. You know, how far can you push the airplane? You know, where are you going to stall it? What are those things you can do? So we actually will fly some BFM rides before we go to the range when we first start in our upgrades. Um, and so that's uh, it, it is a qualification that we have to maintain. It's not one that we do real frequently, um, but it's something we have to maintain more from a defensive perspective. Um, you know, ideally, like I said, you, you know, you get your Raptors, your F-15s, whatever it is that'll come take out the threat before you. Um, but if we have to defend ourselves, we can. And so we maintain that qualification. Um, we've got to be able to do that. So it's fun. 
uh, I wouldn't say that I enjoy it like I enjoy going to the range. Uh, that's why I'm an A-10 pilot. I much prefer going to the range instead. Uh, let's see. Again, looking for some new names on here. Can the A-10 outturn the F-16? Uh, the short answer is it depends. Without going into the specific numbers, um, the A-10 has a pretty impressive turn circle. The benefit us of us being a little bit slower than some of those airplanes is that we can generally turn inside uh, those other aircraft. The problem becomes is when they start going vertical on us, uh, you know, the A-10 can only go vertical for so long. Um, but uh, so, yeah, we can outturn them. It depends on the situation, though. Uh, let's see. Stephen Hampton, I think I answered one from you, but I'll answer this one because I like the Marines. Uh, did you ever do, uh, uh, well, we'll call this a call for fire for the Marines. So um, when I was in Kuwait um, for Operation Iraqi Freedom, so this is 2003, um, the Marines were stationed there with us. Um, so we spent a lot of time supporting the Marines. And essentially what happens is that we, um, when we brief and we get our tasking, our mission from the air tasking order, and we would go see the, the GLOW, the ground liaison officer who would tell us the Army situation. And what we learned was we could be more effective if after we saw the GLOW, we went to the, the Marine uh, talk, their operations center, and just get a feel for what was going on. At the time, um, the Army was on kind of the west side and the Marines were on the east side as we made our approach to Baghdad. And um, it, it just depended on where the resistance was and who was, you know, under fire. And sometimes we would go out with the army and there just there wasn't resistance. They were just pushing through. Meanwhile, the Marines needed help. And I, I know the Marines have their own air, but if we're not doing anything for the army, for us to come home with weapons on was kind of just defeating for everybody. And so we learned very quickly that we would understand the Marine scheme of maneuver and uh, we'd get approval. Um, and then go over to the Marine side and see what we could do for them. So we were, we worked, we worked a lot with the Marines, um, in different phases. Um, and, and we really figured out how we could be effective together. Um, you know, I, I recall one mission where they told us to go over to the Marine side and they said, Oh, by the way, there's an SA six operating in that area. And I'm like, well, all right. An SA six is like a kind of a big deal, um, in terms of a surface air threat. Uh, and they said, no, no, big we've got some some seed for you, some suppression of enemy air defense. And I thought, this is pretty awesome. You know, we're not even tasked to go over there, but here they are coordinating all these air efforts um, for us. Um, so pretty awesome. All right, let's see a few more. Did you spend, uh, this is from Ash Little. Did you spend any time in the JTAC role? If you did, what benefits did you find when back in the jet? Um, so the short answer is no, I didn't. And part of that was, um, so A-10 pilots in 2003, so when we deployed to Iraq, we were tasked to provide battalion air liaison officers. So these were A-10 pilots that were going to be embedded in army battalions. Um, the rules at the time were that women were not allowed to be embedded with at the battalion level. And so uh, I was not tasked to do that. I will tell you that every A-10 pilot that got that task tasking likely wasn't their first choice, right? Like they wanted to be in the air. They wanted to be A-10 pilots. You know, they wanted to go do that job. But I think what they all realized is, one, they all did such an incredible job. They made such a huge impact in terms of air supporting the ground. Um, it was kind of life-changing for them, you know, to see it from that perspective and, you know, to hear it from that perspective. Um, and so I think that was, that was huge for the, the people that were able to do that. It really made an impact on them. And several went on to lead then, you know, from an air side, when the air integrates with the ground, you know, they led some of those organizations. Um, I did have the opportunity in 2010 to deploy to Kabul um, on the ground at ISAF um, Joint Command. Um, and I got an opportunity opportunity sounds like such a good deal uh, to go take a, a convoy from uh, ISAF Joint Command, which was at the airport to ISAF headquarters, which was really a short distance. Um, but just being on the ground in a convoy and know, knowing that there were aircraft overhead, I realized how important it was. 
um, you know, for a sense of confidence, for a sense of security. And I think seeing it from that side, and granted, I saw nowhere near what our Army brothers and Marine brothers saw, but I got, you know, just that little bit of glimpse and insight of, of what it's like. And it reminded me that a lot of times we got tasked to do convoy escort. And it wasn't generally like our favorite thing to do, because a lot of times it meant just we were flying in circles overhead a convoy. Um, but I realized on one mission, particularly, um, I could, you know, I could hear when they checked in and the, the guy on the radio said, I'm not a controller, I'm not a JTAC, you know, I'm, I'm not a joint terminal attack controller, called them GFACs at the time, ground forward air controllers. I'm not qualified. And we're like, it's okay, we got you. Like, we're going to stay overhead. You know, we've got your back. We're going to look ahead. We're going to look, you know, they'd gotten some intel that there was going to be an ambush. And they were scared. And for us just to be able to say, look, we're overhead. We're not going to let anything happen. We're going to be here. We'll follow you all the way to the FOB, the Ford operating base. We'll be here. Um, it reminded me why that, like, even if we're not active in terms of dropping bombs or shooting the gun, like, we're still there for a reason. And maybe it eliminates a threat to our friendlies. Um, so we did a lot of that. Um, and so I think once you have that experience of being on the ground, no matter what it is, it gives you more insight into what our troops on the ground are going through. Um, and so we try to try to do that and get that experience for our A-10 pilots, because I think it makes us better. Great question. Thank you. All right. These are coming in fast. I'm trying to keep up here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Have you ever had a gun jam malfunction? Yes. <laughs> um, so when I was, these were, luckily, I think they've only happened in training, which is great. You know, like I said, the A-10s um, tend to perform better in combat. Um, but we were out in, in Florida doing some testing on the A-10. Uh, we went out to the range and um, had done a couple passes and then shot the gun. And, you know, you get the gun on safe light, you got to completely safe it up and come home. And then when you come home, like the gun, they attempt to like pull you into berm so that if the bullets come out, you're at least in a berm. Um, and they couldn't safe my gun up. Like there were bullets and they kind of get jammed in there sometimes if, if it doesn't work correctly. Um, it cleared the entire ramp out, created lots of work for all our firefighters and, and EOD crews. So um, it doesn't happen a lot, but when it happens, it just creates a big mess. So thankfully that's only happened in training now. And that was from Pat Lev. Uh, still a Marine, always a Marine, right? Uh, A-10 saved my life in Afghanistan. I love that because I hear so many incredible stories of my A-10 brothers and sisters doing amazing things. Um, it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but, um, I love to hear that you, you know, that a 10 saved your life. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, let's see. How cool is it, uh, to go low and fast? I know everybody says fast with quotes. I appreciate that. I know there's a joke in there somewhere. Uh, how cool is it to go low and fast using the train to evade or ingress to the target? Um, any favorite locations to practice in, like the mock loop, for example. Um, so I think, I'm trying to think, um, every place, every t every place a ton pilots are at, we like to go find like where we can go through the terrain, right? Like anytime we can be in the terrain where there's terrain above us, like that's where you want to be. Um, for a lot of reasons, if it's actual combat, then you want to uh, avoid. It. Uh, threats where people aren't going to see you and you're going to surprise them. But in training out at Nellis, um, there's a lot of great places um, out there. I'm trying to think you know, that we call them Star Wars Canyon, um, at Davis Month, and that we'd find the deepest terrain we could out there. I would say one of my best, um, most fun places to fly was in Alaska, uh, flying low out there through the terrain. Um, you know, you could at time you could see the wildlife running, um, you know, flying around those mountains was pretty impressive. So anywhere really where we can get down low. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it actually makes the A-10 feel fast. So like, you know, we're not quite as fast as everybody else, but that's one of those times where it makes us feel fast. Uh, let's see. Have you ever heard of A-10 training using DCS? Um, 
What do you think of computer-based training when it comes to the A10? So I've heard a lot about the uh, a lot about DCS from uh, mostly from people connecting with me on social media, asking me questions, and I have not flown it myself, so I can't tell you. Um, but I have heard other A10 pilots fly it, and they say it's very accurate. Um, I'm a I'm a huge fan of like time in the seat, right? But I've also learned that this virtual world is really impressive. And at the Air Force Academy recently, um, we teach a class that's um, virtual headsets. We can make them Raptors. We can make them A-10s. We can make them any aircraft, and they get the opportunity to fly. Um, and we have, especially now for our students going through pilot training, they get the opportunity to take those headsets home and practice with them. And they are much better pilots than I ever was at that stage of flying because they practice it all the time. You know, I used to sit, I'm a huge proponent of chair flying. So everybody asked me how to be a good pilot. To me, it's chair flying, which means for me, and this is 1999, I'd get a picture of the cockpit, I'd paste it on my wall, I'd sit in a chair and I'd visualize flying in the airplane. Well, now think of this. I mean, instead of staring at a, you know, just a <laughs> photocopy of the cockpit, now you're actually, you've got the full headset. You can you know, talk to people, you can integrate, you can practice all the maneuvers. Um, it's, it's a huge improvement. So I, I love the direction it's taking. There's still something to be said about flight time uh, and air under your ass, if you want to call it that. But um, it, there's something to be said about spending time in an airplane too, to be able to make those time critical decisions and, you know, face those emergencies and things that are unexpected. Um, but I think the combination of the two is really important. So I love where it's going. And one of these days I'm going to have to fly DCS so I can actually sound a little bit credible when people ask me about it. Um, I give you, I can give you some thoughts and advice, but it, it's not about, you know, it's not coming from a DCS background. Um, did you ever exchange with another service or partner nation? Um, <laughs> there's gotta be a story with that one. Uh, so I did not, uh, I did not do any exchanges other than my time in the UK as a grad student, um, but I didn't do any flying exchanges. Um, I did a lot of, um, I guess the, in, I did a lot of work when I was at ISAF Joint Command, uh, all working with our international partners there. Um, I have flown with other aircraft from other nations, whether it's Red Flag or um, even in combat, um, we got opportunities to fly together. Um, Always such an amazing experience. I think you learn a lot from other countries and how they do things. Often um, it could be frustrating too, just in terms of our technology, not always working together. And, and I think that's why you train before you fight. Uh, that's a good thing about red flag. We learn those things that don't actually work. Um, but uh, yeah, that was always, always a fun experience. And um, <laughs> I will tell you that when we were at Bagram, uh, whenever we got invited over to the uh, to the uh, Brit camp. It, we always knew it was gonna be way better than anything that we would ever eat or drink on the American compound. So uh, I always appreciated those opportunities. All right, a few more. We have about 15 minutes left here. Let's see. Um, ever fly the A-10 with uh, the Freckle Puny? if I get that right, ever fly the A-10 with 600 gallon fuel tanks, or did you always deploy without? Um, so we, our fuel tanks are not rated for combat. <laughs> I know that sounds strange. Um, so we generally only fly them to ferry and then we don't use them on combat missions. Um, so we flew up every time we ferried jets across the pond, we flew with fuel tanks, but um, we did not uh, otherwise fly with them, but we had to. That was the only way we could get there uh, without having to refuel uh, all the time. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer this one because it's always the question that gets out there. Um, so how much does the gun affect your airspeed when firing? Uh, from the cockpit, <laughs> imagine, you know, we're diving down at 300 knots aiming at the target, like we never, the airspeed doesn't go backwards. Let's put it that way. Like it's always increasing as we're diving, even if we're going straight for it, we don't shoot the go gun going uphill. So it doesn't slow the airspeed. I've seen lots of calculations on the internet, lots of discussions about thrust and how it works. And the bottom line, which is really what I care about from the cockpit is it, did, it does not slow us down. Nor do, nor do birds hit us from the back. I know lots of, lots of jokes about the A-10. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, I, I, the sad, sad to answer this question, but do you think they'll replace the A10 or update it? I think we will update it for a while, but I think it will eventually get replaced. Um, I just think right now the writing on the wall says that the A10 is not going to last really past 2035. Um, and even then we're going to have a hard time getting there. I think we'll shrink in numbers. Um, you know, but that thing, that, that being said, we've been talking about getting rid of the A10 for a long time and all it takes is a new administration and, um, somebody else to change their mind. So my hope is that it will stay around, but I think eventually it will get replaced. Um, is it a one for one swap with anything that we have? No. Um, on the positive side, we have sent some of our best A10 pilots to the F-35. Why? Because we want them to understand and have that mindset of an A-10 pilot, of a supporter of troops on the ground. Um, so I think, you know, wherever it's at, A-10 pilots are very confident that we want to make sure that the next aircraft, whatever it is, is going to be as good in terms of supporting our troops on the ground. Um, but I think eventually it will get replaced, sadly. Um, let's see. Uh, this is from Viper Mad Dog 39. Um, what method did you take? Be it's been apparently 49 minutes. I'm having trouble reading. Um, what method did you take to become an officer? Um, I went through the Air Force Academy. Uh, I actually didn't know about any of the other sources. I, I mean, I knew about ROTC, but I didn't quite understand OTS or the different ways, you know, to go to the reserve or guard. There's so many ways now um, to become an officer, but I went through the Air Force Academy. Um, which was an incredible experience, uh, one that I only want to do once. <laughs> um, from Henry, uh, tell us about some air-to-air -air refueling. <laughs> Probably my least favorite thing to do in the airplane um, is air-to-air -air refuel. Uh, when it goes well, it's fine. But um, I'll tell you one story of refueling in Afghanistan at night in the weather. Um we rejoin with a tanker and we have learned to use night vision goggles while we refuel. So it helps us see the aircraft. The problem, if there's a little bit of weather, night vision goggles can also be disorienting. So you're not really you're not planning to use them in the weather. Um, but there are some clouds out there. We rejoin with the tanker. The tanker's lights are bright and uh, we re rejoin with the tanker. I get gas, no problem, but I hook up and, um, once I move away, so once you're done refueling, I go to move away from the tanker and uh, I just, my gyros kind of tumbled and I got very spatial disoriented and I could not tell. It seemed like whatever way I was looking were the lights from the tanker. It was like I couldn't get away from it. You know, and I had this vision of like essentially plowing my aircraft into the, you know, into the tanker, which not going to go well, we're full of fuel. Um, but I just couldn't write my head in terms of where, you know, where, how to get away from the tanker. So I immediately said, you know, there's a lot happening very quickly. I immediately said, I'm spatial deed. I took off my goggles and, you know, pulled away from the tanker, trying to look at my instruments. And it, what I had done was done this like barrel roll around the tanker, um, which scared the shit out of me. Um, but, uh, you know, it's those things sometimes like refueling can be, you know, beautiful Blue sky day can be straightforward at night, weather, you name it, uh, can be really challenging. So uh, not my favorite thing to do in the airplane. I have one more story about that, but if I have time, I'll come back to it. Um, let's see. All right, let's see. How about this one? Uh, this one is um, from... I, okay, I came in late, so this question might have already been answered. How well can the F-35 shoulder the A-10's mission brief? And if replaced, is a pure attack aircraft to be preferred? Um, so I haven't flown the F-35, so I can't tell you the answer necessarily to this question. But I can tell you that, um, you know, based on what I said earlier, just there are A-10 pilots going to the F-35, and I think that will be a huge thing. The F-35 is not the A-10. The A-10 is not the F-35. I mean, they're really just not comparable in terms of what their capabilities are. Um, they're just different aircraft. So I think the most important thing is we keep the mindset of supporting our troops on the ground and we train to it so that we can be good at it. Um, would I love to see a brand new A-10? Absolutely. I think it would be pretty awesome. If they ever needed a civilian test pilot, I would I would definitely say yes. Um 
All right. So let's see. Um, a couple here that talk about some of the um, from Glock fan and BYH 20. Any plans to update the A10 with more powerful engines? Um, well, the Air Force Academy cadets just did a, a project uh, to figure out how they could do it. Um, but right now, uh, the short answer is no. Um, there's not been money dedicated for that. Um, but they did get a wing upgrade, um, which is the other part of that question. So we'll call it an upgrade. Really, it's fixing all the damage that we did to the wings. So if we want to keep the ATEMs flying, their wings have to be upgraded. So we're, we are seeing that, and that's happening already. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to, okay, I'll, I'll skip one and come back to one. So, um, I'm a recent A-10 guard select. Congratulations. Do you have any advice for UPT, the B course or any part of the pipeline? Um, I'm excited for your road ahead too. So I think my biggest piece of advice is chair fly. Uh, I talked a lot about that already, but I think, you know, chair flying, um, so chair flying, you know, you, you essentially sit in a chair and think through a mission before it happens, which I think it, with anything in life, if you can spend a little bit of time, whether you're visualizing or just practicing and thinking through something before it happens is really good advice. Chair flying is what got me through pilot training. Um, I struggled my first really three weeks of pilot training with air sickness. I know kind of crazy for a pilot, um, but chair flying, you know, meant that I could really focus on that mission and I knew it was coming. Um, so chair flying is the number one thing I tell people. But I also think it's, you know, this is with anything in life, you work hard. Like if you're at pilot training, that is your sole focus to be an excellent pilot. So work hard, um, be in the vault, right? Studying, knowing all the things, you know, the numbers, the details, all of those things. Um, you, you need to work hard uh, and then have a good attitude um, because you need to show people that you're going to, you're willing to learn. You're going to make mistakes, but you're willing to learn as well. And that's the five minute mark. Is that my, I see Mike pop up. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say like, maybe uh, we can end on uh, one question from, if you can see Alexander, uh, Alexander K. That would be a great one to wrap up on K. All right. Um, okay. I see it. Um, was this your childhood dream? Fly a plane. My daughter wants to be a jet pilot. She is five. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, so I decided when I was 12 that this is what I wanted to do. Um, I I decided first I was gonna, I wanted to be an astronaut, and I figured being a fighter pilot was my way to get there. And so I decided at, at 12 uh, that I was going to be a pilot, and um, I didn't actually know. I, I, it wasn't just any pilot. I was going to be a fighter pilot. And I didn't actually know that in 1986, when I made this decision that women weren't allowed to fly fighters. Um, but my parents didn't tell me that. Um, they just told me to work hard and, and be good at what I did. So um, I did. I worked hard and got to the Air Force Academy and, uh, and went on to be a fighter pilot and, and fulfill that dream. So um, I would tell your daughter really the same thing I mentioned about going to pilot training, right, is work hard, have a good attitude. I think, you know, things in life, if you want them, uh, you got to work hard. You got to put in the work um, to make it happen. So it took a lot of work. Uh, there were plenty of bumps along the way. Um, I got rejected from the Air Force Academy on my first attempt. Uh, you know, I said I puked my way through my first three weeks of pilot training. Um, you know, it, it wasn't like it was an all an easy road, but it's all about like when you face those roadblocks, when you face those hard things that um, you get back up again and you try a little harder. So yeah, it was a high, uh, it was a childhood dream. Um, and I love that your five, five year old wants to be a jet pilot. That's really cool. That's really awesome. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Kim, for coming on the show. It's been an absolutely brilliant Q&A. And thank you to everyone who joined us in the comments there. We had some great questions. Uh, but if you want to go and get Kim's book, uh, look in the description below. Uh, aiming higher it's out now uh, is it all is it in hardback or just um paperback at the moment kim it's just paperback on amazon right now so go and uh, pick that up but thank you uh, very much again uh, kim this has been absolutely brilliant and hopefully you guys enjoyed it too yeah this was a lot of fun i appreciate it and uh i know i didn't get to all the questions so just blame it on the fact that i'm an a10 pilot and i don't move as fast <laughs> as my uh fellow fighter aircraft so um but i apologize if i didn't get to your question they were all great questions uh and it was a lot of fun so thanks for the opportunity awesome cheers guys cheers <laughs>